grace and peace. Back to Luke 8. Back to Luke 8. This is New Testament video 183, Luke lesson 26. Luke 8, verse 19. Father God, may this edify, encourage, and enlighten us as we open your word and listen to what you have to say in it. Thank you for this opportunity to teach and may we have open hearts to receive sound Bible doctrine in Christ's name. Thank you. Amen. Luke 8, Luke 8, verse 19. Then came to him his mother and his brethren and could not come at him for the press. And it was told him by certain, which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to see thee. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. Back to Matthew 12, Matthew chapter 12. Verse 46. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. Mark 3, the companion passage. Mark 3, verse 31. There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat about him, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister, and mother. Back to Luke chapter 8. Eighth chapter of Luke. We just finished the parable section of Luke. The introduction of the parables. Now, if you notice, if you're a Bible student, you will discover the way Matthew and Mark have it is different from the way Luke has it. In Matthew and Mark, the mother of Jesus and his brethren come before the parables. That's Matthew 12, the brethren and the mother of Christ, Matthew 12. In Matthew 13, the parables. In Mark 3, the brethren of Christ, the mother of Christ, Mark 3. Mark 4, the parables. In this case, Luke 8, in Luke's account, the parables come first, then the mother and the brethren of Christ appear. We can look at this in one of two ways. Either Mary, Jesus' mother, and his brethren 
are coming before the parables and they want to speak with Jesus. Then he delivers the parables. And afterward, they come again. They're still trying to get him, get his attention. That'd be Luke now. So in other words, we can say it like this. Matthew and Mark, the mother and brethren of Christ, came before. They wanted to talk to him. He issues the parables. And then in Luke, after the parables, they're still waiting for him. That's one way to look at it. Another way is to simply see them as coming to him one time. Perhaps Matthew and Mark are chronological, and Luke isn't. Maybe Luke is chronological, and Matthew and Mark aren't. It really doesn't matter. There are similar concepts being taught. However you want to look at the, that order, if Jesus' mother and brethren come once or twice, That makes no difference to me. There's something significant being communicated here, conveyed here. The mother and brethren of Christ appear in this context of the parables. As well as, if you recall, in the context of the delayed kingdom. The kingdom is postponed, whether in our mystery program or in the prophetic program. Israel refuses to believe on Jesus as Messiah Christ. It's becoming more and more evident as we progress through Luke's Gospel record. They wanted to murder him in Nazareth. Israel's apostate religious leaders in chapters four and five, chapters five and six, they have controversies, five controversies with Jesus there criticizing him, finding fault with him. We've also seen now, in chapter 7, John the Baptist is in prison. He's languishing away. He will be beheaded, decapitated. Messiah's forerunner is rejected. He is in prison. He will die. Messiah himself has about a year and a half, approximately one year and a half of earthly ministry remaining before his life is taken. Christ's earthly ministry is roughly halfway through at this point. Like I had told you in our previous lesson, it's only now that he introduces parables. Because Israel has been refusing to hear and believe the simple Bible truths he's been teaching and preaching and showing for the last year and a half. Now he begins to speak with parables. The parables are designed to hide the truth. Israel, now you won't understand. You won't understand what I'm saying. You'll hear me physically, but you won't hear me spiritually. You won't grasp, you won't comprehend what I'm saying. And that is the way you wanted it. How can God be so unfair? No, no. See, Genesis 3, blame shifting. It isn't God's fault. It's man's. It's Israel's fault.
if man doesn't want to believe God's word, God will not force man to believe. Romans 1, 2 Thessalonians 2. In Matthew 12 and Mark 3, Israel's apostate religious leaders representing the nation also in apostasy. Unbelief. Unbelief. They blaspheme against the Son of Man. They ridicule the Lord Jesus Christ most vehemently. And he warns them the blasphemy against the Son of Man will be forgiven you Israel but the Holy Ghost is coming in chapter 2 of Acts you had better better treat him with more respect than you have me because the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven you neither in this world nor the world to come you will not enter my earthly kingdom, if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Israel, you had better straighten up. It is in light of that warning, Matthew 12, Mark 3, that the parables are now in effect. Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 8. The kingdom is delayed. What will happen to the world? The world system, especially Israel's throne, David's throne. What will happen to Israel while Messiah is away between his first coming and his second coming? Well, the parables explain the Antichrist will arise in Israel. He will persecute believing Israel. He will incarcerate believing Israel. He will decapitate believing Israel. John the Baptist symbolized them. Israel as chapter 8 opened, Luke chapter 8, Israel has a devil problem, doesn't she? Luke 8, 2, remember those women, those three women in our previous lesson? Those three women healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils? That's Israel, completely given over to Satan. Entirely seven under the devil's control. Mary, what does Mary mean, the name Mary? Miriam, it means rebel, sinner. That's Israel, huh? Sinner, rebel. God's given them some rules, some regulations, the law of Moses, and Israel says, nah, we don't follow that. It's that persistent attitude of unbelief. It's a heart problem that goes back, that stretches back centuries. Israel has been refusing the word of God for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. All the way back to Moses, 16 centuries. When Christ, Messiah, Jesus is born and ministers to Israel, Israel continues her unbelief. Mary, rebel, sinner. And then in Luke 8, verse 3, there's Joanna, Joanna. Remember, that name means, it's the feminine form of John, Johanan, Joanna, 
means Jehovah is gracious. So, Mary the rebel, and now we have Joanna, Jehovah is gracious. Finally, Susanna, Luke 8, 3. Susanna, joyful, cheerful, bright. When Israel the rebel receives God's grace, Joanna, she will be joyful, bright, cheerful, Susanna. That's why those three women are listed there. They're all believers. They're all Messianic Jewesses. And they describe what will happen to Israel in the ages to come when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, when Israel finally accepts him. And so all Israel shall be saved, Romans 11. Israel is delivered from Satan and sin, physical illness, devil possession, at the return of Christ. Isaiah 33, Isaiah 35, Zechariah 13. We've done that numerous times. In the meantime, however, until Israel is restored, we have Luke 8, verse 19. A sad reality. Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press. Mary and Jesus' brethren. Mary, we haven't seen her since Luke 2, when Jesus was a little boy, about 12 years old. Here's Mary and his brethren. Hmm. Do we have something to say about these brethren of Christ? Hold on. Hmm. Controversial. I know. Israel has been rebuked so far for her hypocrisy and wickedness. So Christ delivers these parables. And now, as Jesus' mother and brethren come, there's a crowd preventing them from getting too close to Jesus. So verse 20, It was told him by certain, which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to see thee. Your mother and your brethren are outside. Evidently he's in a house. And Matthew and Mark would confirm that he's in a house. They're outside of the house. They want to come in, but the crowd prevents them, blocks them from entering. Gaining access to him. Your mother and your brethren are outside. They want to see you. Now, recall, one of the keys to Bible study, one of the tips for profitable Bible study, not only should we look at what verses say, but we should also make note of what verses don't say. So, let me read to you what the verse doesn't say. Luke 8, 21. If his mother and his brethren are outside desiring to see him, the Lord Jesus, verse 21, does not say, Yes, let them in. Let them come in. I want to talk with them. I want to hear what they have to say. Come in, come in, come in. No, 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 
No! Why? It's like he brushes them off. Luke 8, 21. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. Hmm. What a response. The Lord Jesus he reacts in an unusual manner, unexpected, unexpectedly. My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. Hmm. been so insensitive. There's a reason, a reason, a valid reason. Doctrine is being communicated here. Are we willing to hear and see or not? The Lord Jesus Christ, He understands. He understands. He recognizes flesh and blood associations are not the issue. What matters, who are his spiritual relatives? Not biological relatives, but spiritual relatives. is doing God's will, who is hearing God's will in Israel, who is doing, who's believing God's will in Israel, God's word in Israel. John 6, John 6 verse 40, John 6 40. And this is the will of him that sent me. What is the Father's will? That everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. In Matthew 12, Matthew 12, verse 50, Matthew's account, For whosoever shall do the will of of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. Compare that to John 6.40. Those who see the Son and believe on Him. That's those in Israel doing the will of God. They're believing on God's Son, Jesus as Messiah, Jesus as Christ. Come over to Mark. Look at Mark. Mark 3.35 For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and mother. Father God's will for Israel at this point on the Bible timeline is for individual Jews to believe in Jesus as Messiah. Christ anointed God's Son they are to receive and trust Him. If you go over to Hebrews 2, go to Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews 2, Hebrews 2 verse 11, For both He that sanctifieth, that's Jesus Christ, and they who are sanctified, that's Israel's believing remnant, the little flock, and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Twelve, 
saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. The Messianic church. Remember, that's not the body of Christ. The church in Hebrews 2.12 is the Messianic church. Matthew 16. Upon this rock I will build my church. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the Messianic church. Hebrews 2 is quoting Psalms in Isaiah. Who are Jesus' brethren? It's believing Israel. It's the little flock. John 1. John chapter 1. John 1. Eleven. He came into his own, and his own received him not. His own didn't receive him. But as many as received him, so there was a believing remnant. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that huh, believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. There's unbelieving Israel and believing Israel in that passage. Christ Jesus came to give Israel the power to become the sons of God. People who would work with Father God in the earth. Accomplishing His will in the earth. Reaching the Gentiles in the millennium. Millennial kingdom. Israel can't bring non-Jews to a personal relationship with her God, until she has a personal relationship with her God. They need to believe on Jesus as Messiah to have a right standing with God. So then, redeemed Israel can go to the Gentiles. Be God's channel of salvation and blessing to the Gentiles. Israel rises to kingdom glory. Come back to Luke 8. Luke 8. Verse 19 again. Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press. And it was told him by certain, which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to see thee. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. You can read Mark 3 and Matthew 12. You can come over to Luke 11. We read those other passages. Come over to Luke 11. Watch this. Hmm. When we get to chapter 11 of Luke, we'll say more about it. And it came to pass, Luke 11, 27, and it came to pass... As he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. But he said, Yea, rather, instead of that, think on this, Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. They obey it. They guard it. They don't pollute it. They protect it. In Luke 11, this lady in the crowd, she cries out, Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which gave thee suck. Jesus, happy is Mother Mary's womb and Mother Mary's breasts. Surely this woman was sincere. She meant well, bless her heart. And yet the Lord Jesus corrected her. Instead of exalting my biological mother, Instead of venerating, worshiping, instead of worshiping my mother, 
like religious Christendom does today, rather than praising my mother's womb and my mother's breasts. Think about this. Blessed, yea, rather, Luke eleven twenty eight. Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. My spiritual family is more important than my physical family. The God of the Bible, you know, if, 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 it's a big if, if we believe the Bible, if we believe the Bible, instead of believing religious tradition, if we believe the Bible, this is what we see in the Bible. This is what we believe. If we're Bible believers, if not, well, we can be tradition believers if we want. But let's call ourselves that then. Don't say, I believe the Bible, and then, no, you really believe tradition. Just say, I don't believe the Bible, I believe tradition. You don't be a hypocrite that way. Or... If you believe the Bible, not tradition, say it. Say, I believe the Bible, not tradition. Okay. There's a lot of double speak, double talk. People speaking out of both sides of their mouths. Courtesy of religious tradition. They say one thing, but they really believe something else. God isn't fool. God isn't the least bit fool. Okay. We, we may fool ourselves, we may fool others, we may fool the priest and the preacher, the theologian, the commentator, but we don't fool Almighty God. The Mary of the Bible, Jesus' mother Mary, unlike the Mary of religious tradition, the Mary of the Bible was a humble woman. She never sought her own praise. She rejoiced in what God was doing and how great He is. Remember Luke 1? Luke 1. Not how great she was or what she was doing. It's rather, what is God doing with and through me? She didn't seek her own praise. Jesus Christ didn't exalt his mother, did he? Remember in Luke 11, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the paps which gave thee suck. Indeed, yes, blessed is Mother Mary's womb. And Mother Mary's breasts. Jesus didn't agree with that woman in Luke 11. In Luke 8, now, I say all that to say this. In Luke 8, your mother and your brethren are here, Jesus. Luke 8, 19, 19 and 20. Luke 8, 19 and 20. Your brethren are here. Yes, let them in, let them in, especially... Mary, let her come in. Everybody genuflect, down on one knee. Quick! Quick, there's the mother of God. No, no, no. We've, we've dealt with all of that already. Already. We've settled that already. Mary and his brethren show up here. Mary and Jesus' brethren. Come over to Matthew 12. Oh my controversy. Matthew 12. Remember that? Let me read it again. Matthew 12, 46. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. 
But he answered and said unto him that told him, Let them in, let them in, especially her. No, mm -hmm. no. Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and my sister, and sister and mother. Matthew 13. These brethren of Christ, these physical brethren of Christ, with his physical mother, they're named. Matthew 13, verse 53. Matthew 13, 53. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? I believe he's more than an ordinary common man. This is in Nazareth, by the way. Where did he get this power from? Well, he's God. He's God in human flesh. That's where he got that power. They don't see that. They don't want to see Matthew 13, 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? He's Joseph's son. <laughs> Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren? Listen, the brethren of Jesus. James and Joseph, and Simon and Judas, and his sisters, at least two sisters. Are they not all with us? Jesus has six half-siblings. Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their faith. Unbelief. 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 That Nazareth's, <laughs> Nazareth's problem is unbelief. Where Jesus spent so much of his life so close to the truth and yet so far from it at the same time. Hmm? 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 Not an evidence problem. Heart problem. Heart problem. Heart problem. Heart problem. Heart problem. This people's heart is waxed. Gross. Callous. Insensitive. Hardened. The hardness of their hearts. Mark 3, 5. Come over to Mark 3, 31 again. There came then his brethren and his mothers, and standing without sin unto him, calling him, and the multitude sat about him. And they said unto him, Behold thy mother and thy brethren, without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them, which sat about him, and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and mother. Mark 6. Mark 6. Mark 6, 1. This is Nazareth again. Same as in Matthew chapter 13. We read it already. Mark 6, 1. And he went out from thence and came into his own country, Nazareth. And his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him? That even such mighty works are wrought by his hands. Is not this the carpenter? Oh, that's, that's all they see him as, is a carpenter. Just a, common, just a common worker like all of us. Where did he go to seminary? Where did he go to college. Where did he learn to perform miracles? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of uh, James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? See the four brethren of Christ? And are not his sisters, at least two, here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled, Mark 6, 6, because of their 
great faith. <laughs> no, he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. Mary had some children. Jesus' mother Mary had some children. Oh my! I just contradicted pervasive Roman Catholic doctrine there. The so-called perpetual virginity of Mary. That Jesus' mother Mary, the idea, it's fiction, okay? It's not true. But here's what so many precious souls around the world, a billion plus, believe. Jesus' mother Mary never had any sexual intercourse whatsoever with any man, ever. And even tonight, she's in heaven, a virgin. She will always be a virgin. The perpetual virginity of Mary. Now, if the Bible is right, and you know good and well, I believe the Bible to be right, is right, Mary most certainly had children delivered from her womb, after Jesus was born. That means Mary is not a perpetual virgin, was not a perpetual virgin. Matthew 125, Joseph knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Joseph didn't know Mary intimately until she brought forth her firstborn son Jesus. That indicates Joseph and Mary did have sexual relations. If they didn't, now would have been a great time, Holy Spirit, to indicate to us. Joseph never had relations with Mary, ever. Mary never had relations with Joseph, ever. Now would have been the good time, the great time. To mention it, Matthew 1. We never read that in Matthew 1. We never read that anywhere in Matthew. We never read that anywhere in Mark, anywhere in Luke, anywhere in John, anywhere in the Bible. Only in our denominational handbook do we find the perpetual virginity of Mary. Jesus had at least four half-brothers. They're named James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, Judah. We never read about the names of his sisters. We never read the names of his sisters. But there were at least two sisters. Could have been a lot more than two. Many more than two. Attempting to keep their religious tradition. Here we go. Some have offered the explanation that these are cousins of Jesus. These aren't his brethren. These aren't Mary's children. Mary's biological children after Jesus was born. These are Jesus' cousins. How convenient. How convenient. Let me run this by you. Who are these brethren? Three explanations. Epiphanius, theologian, church father long ago, he claimed they were Joseph's children from a previous marriage. Another church father, Jerome, quite famous, he believed these are Jesus' cousins, these are children of Jesus' Aunt Mary. And yes, I believe on the basis of the book of John, John chapter 19, Mary did have a sister by the name of Mary. Or three, the third explanation. Are they Joseph's children from a previous marriage? Epiphanius claim that. 
Or were they Jesus' cousins? Jerome claimed that. Or the third possibility, they're Jesus' half-brothers and half-sisters, offspring born to Mary and Joseph after Jesus' birth. The, the most natural explanation is the most likely. They're half-brothers and half-sisters of Jesus through Mother Mary. They're Mary's biological children. We see in Galatians 1 verse 19, there's James the Lord's brother. Brother is in the natural sense. Adelphus, brother, from the same mother. The cousins explanation. These are Jesus' cousins. That's a flimsy argument. These brethren of Jesus are really his cousins. The word used whether in Matthew 12, or Mark 3, or Matthew 13, and Mark 6, or even here in Luke 8, his brethren, Adele Foy, brethren, cousins, cousins, Luke can use the word for cousins if he wants to. Sunganese is the word that Luke, the Holy Spirit through Luke, used in Luke chapter 1, verses 36 and 58. Elizabeth is Mary's cousin. Sunganese Luke didn't use that general cousin term there, even in the Roman Catholic Bible. It's not Sunganese. It's Adelphoi. These are more than just kin, kinsfolk, like in Mark 6 and Luke 2. Kinsfolk. It's not relatives in general. Jesus' brethren here are specific. Adele Foy. Even the Roman Catholic Bible uses the word brethren or brothers when referring to Jesus' brethren or brothers here, not cousins. We are not to interpret the brethren as cousins. The English Bible in whatever translation you want to find. It's not cousins at all. It's brethren, brothers. Indeed, Joseph and Mary had children after Jesus was born. Mary had six children, at least, after Jesus was delivered. That's if we believe the Bible. Okay. If we're Bible believers. By the way, Luke 8, 19, 20, 21. Where's Joseph? Where's Joseph? We don't know. It has been speculated Joseph is dead. Maybe he is. Maybe he isn't. I don't know where he is. Why doesn't the Bible mention Joseph? during Christ's earthly ministry, we see Joseph at the beginning of Christ's earthly life there. We saw him, Luke 1 and Luke 2, and then he disappears from the record of Scripture. You see him in Jesus' infancy, his childhood, but that's it, Joseph is gone. Remember, above all, the Bible is not interested 
in stressing Jesus' foster father, stepfather. The Bible is more concerned with Jesus and his heavenly father, their relationship. We read a lot more about Father God than Father Joseph. And that's the way it should be. Okay. All the more reason to believe that Joseph was not Jesus' biological father. The Bible would have said more about him. Instead, the Bible says more about Father God than Father Joseph. Luke 8, 21. Israel is in unbelief. Israel is in unbelief. I don't consider blood Jews necessarily my relatives. Not simply born of Abraham, but also born again. The Jews who are born again, the Lord claims, they are my brethren. They are my mother. That's believing Israel. His mother Israel. See? Mary, Mary, remember? Mary, rebel, sinner, redeemed Israel. She pictures redeemed Israel. She's a believer. Now what about these brethren, though? Her children, Mary's children, are they believers? No, they aren't. John 7. John chapter 7. John 7. They're in unbelief. John 7, verse 3, Jesus' brethren. They're speaking. Look at verse 5. For neither did his brethren believe in him. They're all in unbelief. Only later, Galatians 1, 19, James, the half-brother of Jesus, becomes a believer. And he's the leader of the Jerusalem church. Acts 15, for example. Israel is in unbelief. And Jesus is withdrawing from them. And he's focusing on that little group of believers, the little flock. He's training the apostles. The parables... He's distancing from Israel. He's distancing himself from Israel. I don't consider apostate Israel true Israel. True Israel will survive the wrath and go into the kingdom. Apostate Israel will perish. Oh, and here we come. There's a storm. Luke 8. Luke 8, 22. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. That's the lake of Gennesaret, Sea of Galilee. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water. And they were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased. And there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. Matthew chapter 8, Matthew 8, Matthew chapter 8, this is the fourth miracle to confirm the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 8, 23, and when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great tempest, a storm in the sea. Insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. 
And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Mark 4 for the companion passage. Mark 4. Mark 4, verse 35. The most information is here. And the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. He was already in the ship there. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, resting comfortably. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? You come back to Luke 8, Luke chapter 8, verse 22. On a certain day, Christ went into a ship with his disciples. He told them, let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launch forth. Let us go to the other side of the lake. Matthew 8, verse 18. Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. Let's go to the other side. Mark 4. Mark 4, verse 35. He told them, Let us pass over unto the other side. Mark 4, 35. Jesus and his disciples are on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. Here, he says, let's go to the other side. We're going east. Eastward. We're going to the east. We're leaving Galilee and going to the east. Other side. Let's go over to the other side. Notice, He's leading. I am at the head of the line. I go first. They follow me. Luke 8, 23. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. He's with them on the ship, isn't he? He's with them. He did not tell them, the Bible doesn't say this. Go to the other side, I'll see you over there. Good luck. Hope you have a safe trip. He accompanied them in the ship, in the boat. I am with them. They didn't hop in the boat and go of their own accord, their own volition. They followed me. I told them that. Get in the boat. We're going to the other side. He's asleep. The Lord Jesus, Luke 8, 23, he's sleeping. Mark adds that little detail. He even has a pillow. He's tired. The God-man sleeps. See his humanity? He's sleeping. God doesn't sleep. God doesn't grow weary. God hasn't closed his eyes one time to go to bed, ever. 
He'll never close his eyes to go to sleep. The Lord Jesus, though, he's the God man. And as a man, he sleeps. As God, he'll perform a miracle. You can see Christ's humanity and his deity in this passage. If we want to, if, if, if we want to. There's a storm of wind on the lake. Luke 8, 23. Christ is sleeping away. The boat is rocking. And look. Look at this. There came down, came down a storm of wind on the lake. A great tempest in the sea. Matthew 8. A great storm of wind. Mark 4. And they were filled with water. Luke 8, 23. And were in jeopardy. The waves are beating against the ship. It has low sides. And what happens? The water gets into the boat. Oh, oh no. Shipwreck. We're all going to die here. Help. Lord, help us. We perish. Master, master. They hurry to him. They're panicking. Get up, get up, get up. We die. We perish. The way. Mark has it. Matthew and Luke aren't as strong. The Holy Spirit makes it stronger in Mark here. Mark 4, verse 38. He's asleep on a pillow at the back of the ship. The ship is full of water. 37, Mark 4, 37. 38. They awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Don't you care? We are on the verge of death. And you're sleeping. You're negligent. Can you imagine? I don't know if I would be as fearful of that storm as to come to the Lord and, 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 and say, Don't you care that we die? Huh? They were completely unjustified in asking, what a dumb question. What folly, foolishness, silliness. Isn't Jesus on the boat with them? Isn't he on board? So, how could he let the ship go under with Himself on it. They're thinking like lost people. The natural man is running them. A little about the storm. Natural storms here first, firstly. The Sea of Galilee is about 700 feet, 200 meters below sea level. Okay. Highlands surrounded mountains. Mountains. You can see some of them here. Dark brown. In the case of the Sea of Galilee, to the northeast, northeast, it's Mount Hermon up here. Mount Hermon is over 9,000 feet, 2,700 meters tall. 
there's a, a huge elevation difference, almost 10,000 feet. three thousand meters. The cold air from Mount Hermon meets the rising warm air from the Sea of Galilee. There's a collision. Storms originate in that manner. The fishing boat it is filled with water there. The waves are being blown around and the boat is rocking. Oh, help us Lord, we won't make it. Panic. He's sleeping. The Son of God is sleeping. And there's a pillow for him. It was a pillow for the helmsman, the one in charge of the boat. He's sleeping. He's sleeping on the helmsman's pillow. He's so tired from ministry, labor, work. He's sleeping. Jesus is sleeping. He's tired. And rather than having a good sleep, He's awakened. It looks hopeless, doesn't it? He doesn't see it as hopeless, but his disciples do. Help! Help! Don't you care? Don't you care? We perish. It seems as though the Lord is unconcerned. So they wake him up. He rose. Luke 8, 24. He knew there was a storm there. He knew. And he rebuked the wind and the raging of the water and they ceased and there was a calm so can you hear can you hear the wind blowing and the waves crashing against the boat the boats rocking those men are crying out for help and their Lord their master is sleeping he doesn't care about us Get up. And so he gets up. And what does he do? He rises from his sleep. And he rebukes the wind and the raging of the water. Shh! Cease your misbehavior. The God of creation. He awakens and he speaks to the natural world. Now he had instituted laws, natural laws in creation, Genesis 1, Genesis 2. This is how weather is to operate. The atmosphere, the natural world, the waters, the lake, the sea. All the behaviors of the hydrologic cycle, water cycle, the hydrosphere, water, the realm of water in the world, he knows how to control those laws, manipulate those laws, so as to bring about the conditions he wants. So, by speaking forth the powerful word of God, his word was with power. The words that I speak unto you, their spirit, their life. The words that give life to dead people, raise the dead. 
heal the sick, cast out devils. That powerful word of God, quick and powerful, it's living and it's life-giving. In this case, Jesus speaks forth and commands. He doesn't ask. I'm the boss. You behave as I tell you. Stop blowing. Stop crashing. No more violent waves. No more vehement winds. And there's a calm. Psh. They cease. He is not simply a man. He's the God-man, isn't he? Again, if we want to remove our denominational eyeglasses and believe verses, see verses for what they really say, Psalm 65, 6 and 7, O God of our salvation, which stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the people. Psalm 89, 89, O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee? Thou rulest the raging of the sea, when the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. That's Jehovah God. Jesus is Jehovah God, isn't he? Psalm 107, 28 and 29, The Lord maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are steel. Psalm 29, 3 and 4, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters, the God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Psalm 93. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. Jesus proves his deity. Right there. Jehovah God calms the storm. I calm the storm. I'm Jehovah. See? See how, see how simple that is? Or we can do this if we want to. We can do this. Look, God will give us over to it. I don't see those verses. I don't hear those verses. Okay, okay, my friend. Enjoy the darkness and the deafness. That sin brings. That pride, denominational pride, brings. If you want to keep your church tradition, go right on ahead. Let's see where it gets you. I can tell you right now, it'll get you nowhere. Because my church tradition got me nowhere. And that's why I came to the point long ago. As a Christian, I have trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Many years earlier, I came to a point, though, in my denomination where I said, this is profiting me nothing. There were some faithful brethren who showed me how to rightly divide the word of truth, handle and believe the Bible dispensationally. They showed me verses I saw. Bible truths I had never seen in my life. I would never heard of in my life. My denomination didn't want me to see those truths. Those denominational preachers, they had a business going. And they were not in the business of saving souls from false teaching, but rather saving funds for the denominational system. I left that denomination and I've never gone back to it. I don't plan on it either. Profitless, worthless nonsense. Luke 8, 25. Luke 8, 25. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? In Matthew it's, why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Mark 4.40, why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? 
they were in the wrong, weren't they? Where's their faith? Oh, ye of little faith, you have such a poor understanding. You have so little insight into what I'm doing, into what my father's doing. Why don't you have faith? Well, what were they supposed to believe? What were they supposed to believe? In this context, before this expedition began, I stressed it. Again, Luke 8.22. Here's the full impact if you didn't get it when I read it. Luke 8.22. Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. The Lord Jesus thought, I guess he, were, he was right, wasn't he? We're going to the other side. We're going to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. We're going here. We're crossing. We're traversing the Sea of Galilee. Going to the other side. Now there's a storm. Help! We perish! No, you won't perish, fools. Didn't I tell you we're going to the other side? They should have all been sleeping next to him. In spite of the storm. See, here, here is faith. Here is faith. The disciples should have gotten into the ship. Yes, we're going to the other side. Oh, look, a storm. Oh, that doesn't matter. We'll still get to the other the other side. Won't hurt us. He said, we'll get to the other side. The master told us we're going to the other side. He's on the ship with us. He won't let anything happen to us. We'll get to the other side. That is faith. Here's unbelief. Master, wake up! Don't you care? We perish. Oh, ye of little faith. Where is your faith? Didn't I tell you? We get to the other side. You ignored what I told you. And now you think you'll die in the midst of the Sea of Galilee. He rises from his sleep. And he tells the storm, Shh, quiet. Calm down. Verse 25, and they being afraid wondered, Ooh, what manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Do you remember the Sermon on the Plain? Luke 6. No, oh, we haven't gotten far from it, have we? Luke 6. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, ends similarly. Luke 6, 46, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings, and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house, and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, violently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. That storm... At the close of the Sermon on the Plain, that storm at the close of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, that storm here in Luke 8, we just read, that storm where Jesus is in the ship, that's in Matthew 8 and Mark 4 and Luke 8, there'll be another storm. He's out of the ship. He goes to meet them in the ship. He walks on water. That's Matthew 14 and Mark 6. Luke doesn't have that one. This first storm, Matthew 8, Mark 4, Luke 8. 
as well as that storm after the Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain, come to the close there, as well as the great flood of Noah's day, the storm there, and lump all of that together, all those storms, and the storm in Jonah's life. Little book of Jonah, the prophet Jonah. And his whale of a tail. It really happened. Yes, it did. Jonah was in the whale's belly, fish's belly, three days and three nights. Dead, dead. Matthew 12. Picture of Jesus Christ dying, being buried, being raised again. Jonah was raised again from the dead. Remember? Well, Jonah didn't want to go to the Gentiles. God said, go to the Gentiles. Jonah said, uh, uh, I'm not going. I'm not going to Nineveh. And he fled. The Assyrians were cruel, mean enemies of Israel. I'm not going. I'm not preaching to those Ninevites. Why, Jonah? We learn later, Jonah 4, I didn't want you to have mercy on them, Lord. I wanted them to get it. I wanted you to pour out your wrath your judgment on those no good, rotten Gentiles. Well, that's Israel. National Israel refuses to go to the Gentiles. Oh, even in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, huh? Unbelief, unbelief, unbelief. They don't want to be God's kingdom of priests. They don't want to go to the Gentiles in the kingdom. They don't want to receive their king. But yet we have Gentiles who want to believe, huh? Oh. In Matthew 12. Jesus condemns Israel by reminding them when Jonah went to Nineveh eventually the storm caused him to change his mind. He didn't want to go. There was a storm. He went in the fish's belly. God killed him. Raised again. He heads off to Nineveh. He preaches. Nineveh believes. Oh. The rotten Gentiles, the Assyrians, in Jonah's day, they believe God's word to them. Israel, Matthew 12, you don't believe God's word to you as spoken through me. Oh, ooh. All those storms, picture, I can take the map away. All of those storms, whether in Jonah's day, Noah's day, or in Jesus' day, they picture Daniel's 70th week. There's a storm coming, Israel. You can see that in 1 Peter 3, 2 Peter 2, and so on. Matthew 24 and Luke 17. There's an evil world system. Just like in Noah's day. The flood came on the other side of the flood. There's a, a believing remnant passing through the flood, surviving the flood. On the other side, there's a new world. Noah, there's a new world. Similarly, Daniel's 70th week, there's an evil world system, isn't there? Yes. Let the flood purge it. Apostate Israel will die. Consumed in wrath. There's a believing remnant, however. Believing remnant in Israel. Going through to the other side. Kingdom. Kingdom blessings. I'm with you, Israel. I'm with you, believing Israel. You may not think that I'm concerned about your suffering during Daniel's 70th week. I am. I am. I'm with you. And what did I tell you? I will see you through to the other side. It's not good luck. I'll see you to the other side. Send them away. I am with you. I'm present with you. I'll see you to the other side. It looks hopeless. Master, we perish. And, as a matter of fact, as we've 
pointed out already, Israel's little flock. There'll be a believing remnant alive in the wilderness to see Jesus return. However, there'll be some killed. John the Baptist is a picture of them in prison and dead. So what? I resurrect you to go into the kingdom. Revelation 20. Any believing Israelites, they're brought back from the dead and they go into the kingdom anyway. So even if you do die, Israel, even if you do suffer, remember, I'm aware. It looks like I'm not concerned. I'm silent. Seven years of Antichrist reigning at least. God is silent. In the third heaven, where's Messiah? He's gone, isn't he? He's absent. He ascended. And he's away. Royal exile, where is he? Where is he? He's unconcerned. He's hiding his face from us. The wrath is being poured out. They don't hear anything from him. But I'm with you. Through the scriptures they learn, he's with them. And then, at the very end, it looks like Satan's won. The Antichrist seems victorious. And suddenly, the heaven opens and Christ returns. <sighs> Second coming, the fire burns to the lowest hell and all of Israel's enemies, all the unbelievers, fall down into that shaft. <sighs> And that's the end of them. Believing Israel goes into the millennium. Other side. I saw you through to the other side, didn't I? Yet I'm faithful. You're not, Israel. God is faithful. You aren't. We aren't. We'll see the kingdom blessings through the remainder of Luke 8. Next time, once Israel gets to the other side, there are some blessings. There are some blessings here. We'll see Satan cast out of her midst. We'll also see there's a believing remnant formed. And we'll also see, finally, Israel raised from the dead. The kingdom blessings. We'll save that for our future studies of Luke 8. That's enough. Whew. Heavenly Father, thank you for your faithfulness as we continue in Luke 8. Bless this time of study in Christ's name. Amen.